Hi, everybody. I'm Melinda Emerson, Small Biz Lady, and welcome to Small Biz Chat Live. You know, Small Biz Chat started as a little tweet chat over 10 years ago on Twitter, but we have evolved. Now we do a live video broadcast with three guests, and we're broadcasting live from my Small Biz Lady fan page, from my YouTube channel, and we're live on Twitter because you know I cannot forget my Twitter peeps. Y'all may be who I am today. And listen, we have an amazing show for you tonight. But let me tell you first about why we do Small Biz Chat. We created Small Biz Chat Live because we wanted to have an opportunity for small business owners to get peer-to-peer -peer device in a safe environment without having to pay a coach or a mentor. And we really wanted to have people, you know, have an opportunity to ask questions and get information that they don't even know that they need to know yet. The mission of Small Biz Chat is to end small business failure. And that has been our mission since day one. Now, let me tell you a little bit about what our goal is. We want to give you tools and tips and information so that you can have the opportunity to take your business to the next level by hearing advice from top experts. Now, tonight's experts are B2B influencer Kelvin Joseph, the speaker launcher herself, Jill Atkinson, is here, and he calls himself the disaster avoidance expert. His name is Gleb Sinspersky, and he is going to give us the do's and don'ts of making good decisions in our small business. So with that, I am so excited to welcome my very first guest to our show tonight. His name is Kelvin Joseph. He is the CEO of Cool Kel Marketing. Kevin helps companies from new startups to Fortune 500 maximize their sales by executing marketing strategy that will communicate their cool. I want to hear about this. All right. Now, he Inc. Magazine recognized him as one of their top 30 entrepreneurs under 30 list in the same year as Mark Zuckerberg. So obviously they saw potential in him. Kelvin is a LinkedIn B2B marketing influencer. He has a great sports marketing background. And he is a member of the American Advertising Federation's Trendsetters. All right, Mr. Cool Cal himself, Kelvin Joseph, welcome to Small Biz Chat Live. Here I am. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. Well, listen, you know, your core expertise is marketing. And, you know, marketing has really fundamentally changed quite a bit in the last five to seven years in particular. What, what is your take on that? Well, decision makers have become obsessed with business outcomes. They're obsessed with, with growth. So marketing used to be like an art form. It's more like a science right now. At big companies, chief marketing officers have 18 months to turn their vision into some results. And if you're a small business out there, you know if you hire a marketing professional, you want an immediate return on your investment. So that's changed marketing because it's very, it's not, it's not an artsy thing anymore. It's like, I need results now. Mm -hmm. So you, I've, I've actually read something on LinkedIn that you said that marketing has really become synonymous with authenticity. Can you, can you expound on that a little bit? Yes. Well, the reason why being authentic is so important is because your personal brand and your company brand, that's really your reputation. There's too much transparency to trick the consumer. You have to be authentic. You have to have a real value proposition. You can't just, even if you trick someone into buying your product or service, it's not a long-term strategy. You actually have to be the brand. You actually have to provide real value. And if you don't, you will lose. Right, because somebody can go right to social media and torture your brand in seconds, right? You know, give them a bad experience. They will let the world know, right? They say when people have a good experience, when they tell one or two people, when somebody has a bad experience, they tell 10 people. So, and on social media, you know, if you're somebody like me or you, you know, I got 300,000 followers on Twitter. So, People don't mess with me, you know what I mean? But uh, I can I can imagine that, you know, luckily I don't use my powers for evil. I do want to say that publicly, but, you know, I, I mean, I could. And so the point is, is that you do have to be careful. Um, but now one of the other things that I've, I've, I've read that you write that um, you said that the fourth industrial revolution is really big data and artificial intelligence. But, you know, when you say big data to a small business, they're looking at you like, What's up, Doc? I'm trying to make payroll on Friday. Like, you know, what, how how can a small business owner 
compete or really even leverage any kind of AI or, you know, big data tools? The reality is that you might not be able to play that game. It's, it's, it's the old thing. You might have to move like a speedboat and, and you'll beat the Titanic every time if you're able to have personalization, customization, and specialization. The reality is, as a small business, do not try to be a jack of all trades. Just be that, that master of one. And that's how you compete with these big guys because they're spread out too thin and we could just go in right in there and kill them. Okay, all right, so you say be a speedboat because they are the Titanic, okay. All their big marketing budget and stuff, they the Titanic and I'm I'm out here in my speedboat, but I, I can still beat them. Okay, I, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna internalize that. All right, so, so what do you think is the best way for small business owners to grow their sales? It's, we're all in a relationship business. Doesn't matter what we do and what industry we're in. Relationships are so important. And if you want to grow your business, we need to make friends before we need anything. That's, that's critical because a lot of small businesses, cash is tight. There's a lot of pressure um, to get things done. And we live in the, the here and right now. But the reality of it is, is that we can't rush this thing. You have to have a real value proposition, add real value to people. But if you want to have sales quickly, you don't want to become a used car salesman. Most small businesses, some of them turn their business into, into a, a collection agency. What's a collection agency? They only call you for one thing. They want money now. <laughs> so if you want to be a bill collector and turn your business into a bill collector, that is the fastest way to run yourself out of business. It's insane. Make friends before you need anything then introduce them to each other, add value, and don't expect anything in return. And you will win in the long term. Don't get desperate. Right, because every everybody can smell fear and desperation, right? Dogs, children, people, everybody can smell it. So Run away. <laughs> bad, bad energy, bad mojo, right? So, um, so how do you think, if, if people shouldn't be calling on the phone when they need business, what, what, how could they attract new customers as opposed to chasing them? Melinda, if I call you, I'm a salesman. People don't trust salesmen. But if you call me, now I'm an expert. <laughs> when you're an expert, that speeds up the relationship building process. People call me. It's like, how can I help you? What motivated you to call me today? If I call them, they're like, what do you want? I'm busy. I'm, I, I, I. So the reality of it is, is that we have to attract customers instead of chasing them because people do not want to be sold to, but they love to buy. Mm -hmm. that, that, I don't know if that's profound or is that a preacher's message on Sunday? I'm not really sure, but okay. Let me, let me, let me keep going with you though. So, you know, if, if you want to attract new customers, you want to add value before you want to make a, a selling relationship, then that means you got to get into social selling. That means you got to be out here drawing attention to yourself. And, and I know that, um, you're really, really big on LinkedIn and you believe that that is the primo um, social selling, you know, sort of like platform, especially if you're selling B2B. Um, but, but tell me why you're like, tell me, tell me how social selling has impacted your business and how you've been able to leverage it. Well, I, I was a late adapter. Um, I actually didn't believe in social media. I'm kind of old school. Ooh, and... that's bla blasphemous. Are you serious? <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> I'm like, I'm a walking, talking social brand going, what did he so, say? Oh my so, God. Okay. <laughs> what? <laughs> so I actually, like, I, I, I'm applying for the Guinness um, Book of World Records because I have the largest LinkedIn following without having any other social media account. I have not, I have no Facebook, no Instagram. I'm not gonna snap you, none of that is happening. So you can only find me on LinkedIn and I have about, I have about 40,000 professionals with a secondary reach of 100 million people. So it, it's pretty interesting that has really helped my brand. 
Um, and the reality of it is, it's what helped me to leave running a, a huge company to, to, to betting on myself, having that social media support behind me and building myself as a brand. All right. So when did you get on LinkedIn? Because I want to know how long did it take you to get 40,000 first connections on LinkedIn? That's a lot of that. I don't even have that many. I mean, I got 15,000 and I thought that was like an A1 uh, account. So how when did you get on LinkedIn? Uh, two years ago. And you got 40,000 connections? Well, you've been working LinkedIn like a job. I mean, that's crazy. Okay, all right. So, well, see, all right. That was <laughs> like 40,000 connections I mean, the reality is, years. Did you listen, automate that? What are you even doing? Like, that's crazy. So, but I would ask you another question, though. How can small business owners leverage LinkedIn? Like, like how did you do it? Because that, that, that I, I need to understand. Like, how did you do it? You, you know, like, on LinkedIn, I cheated a little bit. I was walking around with celebrities doing interviews and and taking pictures with with celebrities, which which made people think I was interesting. So, I, you know, I spent a lot of my time in sports marketing, celebrity marketing. So if you're with if you're with Khloe Kardashian, then people, you know, they kind of get into it. It's interesting. I see. I see. All right. So so you 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 leverage the the celebrity influencers to get your game going. I see. I see you. All right. So. So let's talk about how people follow up on LinkedIn. Cause I've seen people do like some creepy weird stuff on LinkedIn. Like the, the second after I connect to them, then they send me some whole like long diatribe pitch like through LinkedIn. Um, does that really work? Or like, what is the proper way to follow up with people with new connections on LinkedIn? Yeah, a lot of people treat LinkedIn like, like a cheap date. It's almost like, hey, um, they connect with you, and then next thing you know, it's like it's like you have to check if you're pregnant because these people, I mean, they're all <laughs> over you. So, I mean, never do that. Never ever do that. I mean, if you're a small business and you do that, man, I feel like this should be like, you should be kicked off the platform. I mean, it doesn't work. We're in a relationship business, so. If if the if I meet you and you're all over me, that I mean it, it's unattractive, it's unappealing, it's like it's it's sleazy. So oh, okay. the best way to do use LinkedIn is to build yourself as an expert in your niche. I call it the cool. Every company needs to have a value proposition, something that they're passionate about, something they're really really good at, where they can bring value to the marketplace. And all you should be doing, the only follow-up on LinkedIn you should be doing is when you're helping and adding value. You should never be asking for anything. People will call you um, when it's appropriate and the right people. So I, I try not to play a volume game. Um, I do respond to every message and I respond to every comment that someone gives me and I give everybody this, the same respect my idea is if you help a thousand people, you only need about three of them to turn into real business for you. And if you can't get three people out of a thousand to be attracted to you, you're doing something wrong. Well, you know what? I think that can preach right there. All right, look, we're going to go to break right now. But when we come back, we're going to talk more with Kelvin Joseph. He's going to talk more about this cool thing he's got going on. And you are watching Small Biz Chat Live. I'm Melinda Emerson, Small Biz Lady, and we will be right back. <laughs> Hi, I'm Melinda Emerson, Small Biz Lady. I know you might be thinking about quitting your business and going back into corporate America, but wait, before you give up, my new book, Fix Your Business, could give you a whole new lease on life. My 12 P's of running a successful business will walk you through step by step how to grow your business revenue, how to hire great people and streamline your processes and so much more. Grab a copy today of Fix Your Business and get your life back.
Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Small Biz Chat Live. I'm Melinda Emerson, Small Biz Lady, and we have been talking live with Kelvin Joseph, and he is going to keep going. Right now, Kelvin, I want to come back to you and talk about influencer marketing. Is, is an inf and I know that you're a B2B LinkedIn marketing influencer. I'm a small biz influencer. You know, is that what everybody should be trying to be now? Can everybody be an influencer? Well, the thing is, is that you don't have to be a big influencer, but you should be an expert in whatever your value proposition is. Even if you have a small following, I mean, for me, I don't, I don't need thousands of customers. I, I could do great with just a handful, you know, or two handfuls. So you don't necessarily need to be millions of followers where it means nothing. You need to have a, a nice niche and be the expert in your niche. And when people say your name, it, it actually means something specific instead of a jack of all trades you'll be a master of one all right all right i like it so let's switch gears i want to talk to you about event marketing because i know you actually do event marketing in kind of a really interesting way so why is event marketing so powerful and how have you been able to leverage it for yourself event marketing is very powerful because we're all busy we're really busy so if i don't know you i don't like you I don't trust you. I'm not doing any business with you. So if you ask me to have a meeting, that's almost like asking someone you don't know on a date. It's awkward. I don't know you. And maybe, you know, you want to get to know me. Great. It's weird. But if I ask you to come to a party where other CEOs are going to be at the party or a dinner for, for 10 um, influencers or 10 decision makers in your area, I want to come to that dinner because I could do business at that dinner. And it's not just talking to you who I don't know. Maybe later after we get to know each other, then I'm ready for that, that, that intense one-on-one. -on -one. But before that, like I can get home to my kids instead of having 10 dinners with, with separate people just to get one of them to do business with me. I'll have one dinner with 10 CEOs, introduce them to each other. And all, at the end of the night, they're all saying, Cool, Cal. That guy is really cool. <laughs> I love it. I love it. All right, but now, what's the hardest part? I, getting people to come to this dinner is is, is tough. Like you know, with audience development is a challenge, no matter how you do event marketing. So, what what's your secret to get get X Y Z CEO that you don't know that well to come to your dinner party? Well, since they don't know you yet, they might not want to just come because of you and your company and your value proposition. I have found that if I could get one big name to come, other people want to come and, and rub um, shoulders with that big name. So sometimes uh -huh. it's just getting one domino to fall and getting, well, you know, so-and-so is going to be there and so-and-so, and then they want to do business. So I only want decision makers. I don't want to be in a room with a bunch of salesmen and nobody's buying. Right, right. You got to be in the room with decision makers. All right, last question. What is the best business advice you've ever been given? Marketing advice. Well, a lot of times marketing, again, used to be about just the brand, but we got to get results. I got bills, you know, we got to make sales. So marketing is just a nice way of saying long-term sales focus. And <laughs> We need to draw customers to us. We need to be the brand. We need to be um, chased instead of chasing people. And the reality is happiness is success. And when your humility exceeds your ability, that's when you win. I love it. Well, you know what? We're going to leave it right there. We're going to put a pin on the end of that. And we're going to say, listen, up next on Small Biz Chat Live, we're going to switch gears and we're going to talk to Jane Atkinson. And she is going to give us the lowdown on how to get paid well as a speaker. All right. There's, anybody can speak, but she's going to talk about how to build a six-figure business speaking. Don't go away. You're watching Small Biz Chat Live and we will be right back.
My new book, Fix Your Business, is really about encouraging people to take back control of their business and change how their businesses is run. It's not okay to skip paychecks. It's not okay to never feel like you can take a vacation. And it's also not okay to not know how much profit you've made in your business until your taxes are done. I really want business owners to stop letting their businesses be runaway trains. I've written this book to teach people processes and systems to help them run their businesses intentionally. My goal is to help existing entrepreneurs create a business that allows them to live their dream life. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Small Biz Chat Live. Listen, if you're interested in starting a side hustle in 2020, I'm doing a free webinar tomorrow. So check me out. Go over to succeedisyourownboss.com and register. And I want to see you tomorrow evening because I'm going to teach you how to do side hustling the right way. All right. Now I'm going to get back to my guest, Miss Jane Atkinson, who I've known since I first got started as a professional speaker. And she, her nickname is the Speaker Launcher. <laughs> That's how she's known. But she is going to give us the lowdown on how to build a successful speaker business. But first, before I do that, I want to welcome everybody who's watching on my Small Biz Lady fan page. All of you guys giving us a shout out over on my YouTube page. And don't forget my Twitter page. Y'all know I love you. So we're broadcasting live on Periscope on Twitter as well. And we want to make sure that you know that Small Biz Chat is about helping you succeed as your own boss. And our mission is to end small business failure. All right, now it is time to talk about building a six-figure speaking business. As a business coach for speakers, my guest Jane Atkinson's specialty is to help speakers identify and move past the things that may slow business growth. She helps speakers at all levels develop and launch their businesses and solidify their brands. And more importantly, she is all about monetizing a speaking business. There's a whole bunch of people out here speaking that aren't getting paid jack and she is she is the ante to that so her signature training program is called the wealthy speaker school she offers online courses and coaching and masterminds to help speakers at every level of the journey jane welcome 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 to small biz chat live it's so good to see you Thank you so much for having me here. I am thrilled to be on your show, Melinda. I've been seeing it all over the place for years. You're blowing up out there. Oh, well, thank you so much. That's high praise coming from you. Listen, uh, if somebody wants to become a professional speaker, what should they do to get started? Well, they really need to think about, and, and Calvin alluded to this a little bit earlier, what is their lane? We call it picking a lane over here and system, which is kind of like a ready, aim, fire process. And when it comes to picking a lane, we're really talking about what topic do you want to be known for, say, five years from now? Because a lot of people out there, and no doubt many of your listeners and viewers are really, really smart people. They could be doing a whole bunch of different topics and they see a speaker and they're like, oh, I want to do that. That is such a cool thing to get up on stage and then to get paid. What? And so uh, <laughs> really being able to identify what your expertise is and what your lane is, is really the first step. And to do that, you know, you just kind of filter back through your history. And if you've built a small business successfully already, then you're really thinking about why did this work? What am I really good at? Mm -hmm. So do you need a speaking strategy then? Yeah, well, game fire approach. So in the ready stage, we get crystal clear on what we're selling. Very difficult to go 
farther if you don't have this in place. And we pick a lane, we develop some marketing language, and we kind of identify who our, our target audience is going to be. Then we can move into AIM, and that's where we develop out our marketing materials. We're talking about website, we're talking about maybe video at this stage. And then and only then do we fire and we roll it out to our target markets. And I think a lot of people just wanna get on the phone and start talking to people because what? That's the fun part, right? right. Talking about yourself and what you can do to help them. Um, but really we like to make sure we have all of those things in place because if you do get on the phone, before you have that clarity, I think you'll lack confidence. We have a saying, clarity equals confidence. And so that's really job one. I love it. I love it. Clarity equals confidence. That is tweetable and definitely is something we should all keep in mind. But, you know, where where do you see people stumble, though, in executing? Like, is it, 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 is it getting on the phone too early? That could be one thing. Uh, it could be that because they are thinking, okay, well, I'm going to go out to the market. I'm, I'm going to have three offerings. Um, where they find it difficult is when they're talking to a client, they're trying to filter through, okay, well, which one should I offer them? Plus when they go to write their website, Writing your copy for your website when you have a lack of clarity is very, very difficult. So I think that's probably, I mean, there's lots of stumbling blocks, but I think that's probably the first one that we tend to see people getting hung up on is really deciding. And then Melinda, they just have to go forward fearlessly with it because you can doubt yourself and second guess all day long. Uh, but really the market's going to tell you incorrectly and what do you do you pivot and go again so once somebody gets all their stuff straight and they want to start getting paid to speak what what should they do first i mean or what is the right amount for them to even ask for like is when you first get started as a speaker is it like five hundred dollars and you know like what like what should you be asking for till you get to the point where you can build up the you know be the 40 50 grand keynote speaker Right. 40, 50 grand keynote. That's like, um, not exactly ex presidents, but it's probably some that's like celebrity, celebrities, that's, right? That's like big but, celebrities. So, so we do, we realistic, do. realistic, real world people that build up a successful speaker in business. Is it a 20,000 or 25,000 keynote? Is that, well, is that where it's going to depend on where you've come from, right? But, so sure. if, if you have worked your way up the ladder in a corporation, uh, a C-suite job, and you're stepping out and you have, a, you know, some pretty hefty bio behind you, for you to go out into the market and say, yes, I would like $10,000 is not unseeable. It's not unthinkable that that should happen. I talk about, I talked about way back in the first edition of uh, the Wealthy Speaker 2.0 that um, $1,500 is kind of when you're in the game. Like that's the base. And then we kind of start going up from there. So if you feel like you're just getting started, you're just dipping your toe in the water and you don't feel like you have that level of notoriety or bio line item that really makes you, um, or, or perhaps you haven't written a book yet, then you might start there and work your way up. 3,500, 5,000, 75, 10, and on up from there. Uh, but there are lots of people I have uh, coming to me who are executive companies and they are starting out above 10. Okay. Okay. I awesome. think that's actually really good advice because I think there's about a bunch of unrealistic expectations out here that people have about what it is to get paid to speak. Um, what do you think is the best form of marketing for people who are professional speakers? Oh, that's such a great question. And the best form of marketing is a kick-ass speech. That is really <laughs> the, the epic keynote is... Um, when somebody comes up to you afterwards with their business card in their hand and says, Oh my gosh, I need, I have somebody else who needs to hear this, you know, write this down on the back of the card. It's, it's this date. And, uh, we have this going on. That's when, you know, when you're getting a three, four spinoff from every single engagement, that's when, you know, your speech has arrived. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> 
the best, or there is no better form of marketing. You can have a brilliant website, but go out and deliver a mediocre job. You're not going to get the next one and the next one and the next one. And your job is just going to be that much harder. So yeah. really great. But the best form of marketing is a great and epic keynote or an epic speech. All right. So, a, you know, do you have to write a book? I mean, do you have to have some kind of back end sales? Is that really the best way to do it? Or is it just about going in there and getting my little speaker fee and rolling out? I mean, I personally, I love to pre-sell books. When somebody calls me and books me to speak, I'm like, oh, how many people are going to be there? Oh, it's going to be an audience of a thousand people. Well, you know, do you have budget or a sponsor to like, you know, put one of my books in the hand? I mean, I've actually even cut my fee if they'll take the books. And the reason why I do that is because it's more valuable to me to have my brand walking out the door with everybody who's in that room. So I've even taken a haircut on fee before to do that. But I was wondering if that's one of the strategies that you like kind of teach the people that you work with. Absolutely. It's really up to you when you decide to write the book. It's a little bit of a chicken, egg, cart, horse, whatever you want to say um, situation. What writing a book helps you do, and I'll bet you found this, is really lay out your ideas. You know, that ready, aim, fire formula that I shared with you earlier. When I laid that out for the book, that actually became the foundation for everything we do. And here we are, 15, 17 years later, we're still using that same formula, and we just built an entire school on it. So it's really terrific to lay out your ideas and label them. That's another little technique. You want to really kind of create language that is your own. So Joe Calloway gave me the pick a lane idea and I, I, rec I recognize him for that in the book, but my name has become synonymous with pick a lane because the book talks about that so much, how important it is. So really labeling your ideas, getting them down on paper it's great. When I think you really feel the not having a book is when you start to have bigger and bigger audiences. It's like, oh, I just spoke to 500 people. I could have done some really good back of room. Or like you said, I love a good pre-sale, Melinda. What you, what your idea and to have a thousand evangelists taking your book home now, and people really want to take a piece of you with them. So I love that idea. It's really just up to you when you do it. I have a lot of people who've come to me who've already written their book and now they're ready to launch their speaking career. There's no wrong way to do it, really. Yeah, what I have found now that I've been in business for 20 years, believe it or not, I need to knock on some wood for that, um, is that what before I write a new book, I've written three books now. And what I did before my last book, Fix Your Business, was I actually worked on the keynote speech and gave the keynote speech out a couple of times before I wrote the book. So it was almost like I was testing my system in, mm. for the book by doing the speech That's and true. testing it on audiences and trying to get feedback first. And then I turned it into the book. And so once you become a seasoned speaker, you kind of can do some things yeah. like that. Um, but that is almost like you figure out your teach first, right? You figure out your speech first, and then you turn around and turn that into the book. And um, that's what we were able to do. And, yeah. and it's been really, really successful for me. I love that. And I've had a few people through my podcast say, you know, they would stake their claim in the ground, write a book on that subject, speak on that for two or three years, and then they would write the next book, stake their claim and go on from there. So it's something that can continue to evolve. I've also done three, and I gotta tell you, I'm a little hung up on number four. I'm having a hard time getting it off the ground. <laughs> I, you know, I, it takes a little bit of motivation to really get it done. And the first one I think was a little bit easier, maybe, I don't know. Well, you were scared the first time. So that was your motivation, you know, maybe. Then, now it's like, oh my God, it's all this work. Um, <laughs> but listen, I'm going to put a pin in us right there. We're going to go to commercial. When we come back, I want to talk a little bit more about speaker revenue models. I'm Melinda Emerson, the small biz lady. You're watching small biz chat live and we'll be right back. <laughs> Are you tired of struggling in your business, not taking a paycheck, dreading dealing with your business in the morning? Are you regretting even starting your business in the first place? Well, I know you're tired, and I also remember what that kind of tired is like. 
But the good news is, it's time to stop feeling that way. Stop! I'm Melinda Emerson, Small Biz Lady, and my new book, Fix Your Business, is a 90-day turnaround plan to get back your life and reduce chaos in your business. I've been in business nearly 20 years, and let me teach you how to build a business that works for you. Grab a copy today. Don't forget, if you're interested in starting a side hustle in 2020, check out my new webinar, How to Be Side Hustle Success. Um, we are doing it on Thursday, November 21st. It's not too late to sign up. Head over to succeedasyourownboss.com to register today. All right, now let me get back to my guest, Jane Atkinson. She is the speaker launcher. And, and Jane, I want to talk to you about speaker revenue. Obviously, your speaking fee is the, is the first and most obvious revenue model, but, but okay. can you talk to us a little bit about some of the other things that you can weave into your speaking business to generate even more money? Well, there's a lot of different ways to do that. And if you want to go deeper with a client and have long lasting change, you might decide that you want to expand beyond keynotes to training. You might add consulting to the mix. You might add executive coaching into the mix. There are lots of models that uh, people are getting paid to do webinars. Uh, they're, they're monetizing their podcasts. They're writing books. Uh, they're developing online uh, learning platforms and membership sites. I mean, really, the list goes on and on. And I'm sure your, your viewers are probably doing a lot of those things already. And maybe they just want to pull some speaking into the mix. It could be the reverse, too. Yeah. What do you think is the most like sort of like the hottest one that everybody's jumping on? Is, is it podcasting? I would say that podcasting is probably the new uh, favorite thing to be get involved with. And we actually have a podcast coming out about podcasts <laughs> on Thanksgiving Day. Um, it, and I think probably secondary to that might be the online learning platform because courses have just exploded as well. So online courses and, and podcasting, you really think seeing that is like kind of where a lot of people are going? Yes, I do. What about having your own branded events? Sometimes I see speakers out here now doing um, intensives or you know VIP yeah. weekends and retreats and this it. kind of stuff. Where, where do you see that kind of falling in terms of, of, of a revenue model? Love it. Okay, bring them to you. That is a brilliant, brilliant um, idea. So let's say that you speak to, you know, women on leadership, you know, claiming their place at the boardroom table. Well, you could be having treats in your backyard. The, the, the reason I love the idea of this is because you can bring them to you and that takes you off the road. You know that the road warrior travel thing um, can get a little bit weary after a while. And so if you say, okay, well, I'm just going to find a great venue somewhere by me. And then a couple of times a year, just hold my own retreat. Brilliant. I love it. I do my own live event once a year. I, I can't really manage it beyond once a year. We've decided that that's all we're going to do because it's just a lot of work to put bums in seats. Yeah. Audience development is, is the nightmare of event marketing. So, um, but now I, I do want to ask you, and this is sort of like the last question I want to ask you, if you are a, a seasoned speaker and mm -hmm. you know, business has kind of slowed down because there's maybe there's some younger, prettier models out here. Um, <laughs> you know, what should you, what should you do to sort of like hit the reset button? Well, you know, I often reinvention can get things going because we're always, um, I think a lot of people neglect their client database, people that already know, like, and trust them. So if you kind of do a reinvention and then go back to the well on your existing set of clients, and the other thing that reinvention does is when you 
decide that you're going to up level your content or move off in just a little side direction on what you've already been doing, you get more energized. You know, if you've been giving the same speech or the same type of content for several years, you're probably do anyway, or you may get bored. You may risk getting bored. And so I would say a good solid content, um, you know, we throw it all out and then audition it. I think that's Eric Chester's line to see if it makes it back in. And then we add some new things or we level up uh, what we're doing. I think when you work on uh, your own stuff, that gets you reengaged with it. And it's really think about it. It's like the energy that you're putting out into the world. If you're kind of stale and bored, then that's a great reason to do it. And then you can go back to the well on all of your existing clients. All right. Well, listen, I really feel great that uh, you told me I'm doing a bunch of stuff, right? That's good. Yeah. But, but I'm also really excited that you've given us actual, you know, tangible things that we can think about and go and do. So thank you so much, Jane. Don't go away. I'm going to bring you back at the end of the show. But right now we're going to switch gears. We're going to go to break real quick. And when we come back, my next guest, Glebs, oh my goodness, I have practiced this man's name and now I'm going to butcher it. I'm going to try it again. Glenn Sespersky is going to be with us and he is going to help us learn how to make the right kinds of decisions and stop trusting our gut. You're watching Small Biz Chat Live and we will be right back. <laughs> Hi, I'm Melinda Emerson, Small Biz Lady. I know you might be thinking about quitting your business and going back into corporate America, but wait, before you give up, my new book, Fix Your Business, could give you a whole new lease on life. My 12 P's of running a successful business will walk you through step by step how to grow your business revenue, how to hire great people and streamline your processes and so much more. Grab a copy today of Fix Your Business and get your life back. Welcome back, everybody, to Small Biz Chat Live. I want to thank all of my folks that are streaming with us live on my Facebook fan page, live on YouTube, and you know we're also streaming on Twitter because you know I love my Twitter peeps. Listen, we are back with my guest, Glenn Dispersky, and he is known as the disaster avoidance expert, but he told me in the break that I was allowed to call him Dr. T, so that is exactly what I'm going to call him <laughs> going forward. And he is on a mission to protect business leaders from dangerous judgment errors known as cognitive biases by developing the most effective decision-making strategies via his training firm, Disaster Avoidance Expert. He is a cognitive neuroscientist and behavior economist, and Dr. T writes for Inc., Time, CNBC, and he's the best-selling author of his new book, Never Go With Your Gut, How Pioneering Leaders Make the Best Decisions and Avoid Business Disasters. Woo, that's a lot, Dr. T. I, I want to get into this with you. Um, you say that business owners should never trust their gut when making decisions. And a lot of us only trust our gut. So what are you saying? We've been out here making bad decisions for forever. Um, unfortunately, you have been. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> so what the recent research on this topic shows is that our gut is evolved for the savannah environment when we were hunters and gatherers living in small tribes of couple of dozen people and reacting with saber-toothed tiger responses to what's going on, you know, having that fight or flight response. So that's what our gut is adapted for. It's not adapted to the modern business environment. And that's why half of all small businesses fail within the first five years of when they're created, according to the Small Business Administration. So, you know, we can see that a lot of small business owners make a lot of bad decisions. And of course, many more fail within 10 years and so on. And large companies fail. I mean, look at what happened with WeWork right now. It used to be worth $75 billion six months ago, six months ago. And right now it's worth about $7 billion. Whoops, <laughs> that's so much value. 70 billion wiped out, it's an order of magnitude because of terrible decisions by its founder, Adam Newman. He still got an amazing payday to be somebody who makes bad decisions, but that's another show. <laughs> All right, but listen, so, so you're saying, I, I guess I want to clarify what you're saying. You're saying there is not any time when I should trust my gut? 
the only times you should trust your gut, your instinctive tribal intuitions, is when you're in a situation just like the Savannah environment. So, for example, with someone you've known for a long time, that's like a, you're a tribal member, that's someone who you feel to be part of your tribe. When your gut tells you something is off with this person, like, let's say, a long-time business collaborator, that may be a valid time to trust your gut. So that's in a business situation. Now, in a life situation, you don't want to think too long when you know when you have a bus coming at you. You want to use those fight or flight responses to get out of the way of a bus. But in pretty much in any time in business, you don't have a decision that's like a bus moving at you. You have at least a few minutes to think about it. And that's when you don't want to trust your gut. You actually want to use your head and think things through. All right. So walk us through. I know you've got a process for this, right? So tell me, how does one... Uh, how should we approach, you know, heavy decisions in our business? Well, the first thing I want to talk to is small business owners often need to you approach small decisions. So first, let's start with small everyday decisions that you don't want to screw up, that you want to get right. What I have for my clients is actually the small little card right here with five questions to avoid decision disasters that I give out to all my clients, very useful. So the first question, what important information did I not yet fully consider about this decision? Why is that question important? Because our gut intuitions cause us to choose decisions that feel comfortable to us. And often the things that are comfortable to us are the worst things for us. We need to look at information that is uncomfortable to us, information that we don't tend to consider in order to make the best decision. So that's first. Second, what dangerous judgment errors have we not yet addressed? And my book, Never Go With Your Gut, How Pioneering Leaders Make the Best Decisions and Avoid Business Disasters, right there, talks about the 30 most dangerous judgment errors for businesses. How can small business owners avoid these dangerous judgment errors? Third, what would a trusted and objective advisor tell you to do? So imagine a little Melinda on your shoulder telling you, you know, giving you a little advice out there. Think about what she would tell you you need to do. So that's, uh, those are three questions. Fifth, uh, fourth question, what, how have you prevented all the ways that this decision can fail? Again, how have you prevented failure in this decision? Think about all the threats and opportunities and make sure you seize the opportunities, avoid the threats. Finally, last question, what information would cause you to change your mind? You want to decide this in advance as opposed to in the heat of the moment because you'll be too biased in the heat of the moment too influenced emotionally to make this decision. So you want to think what would change your mind in advance of the, you know, launching a product or something like that. That's a lot. Okay. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to have to unpack that because that's, that's a sure. whole lot of questions. It's interesting because I, um, uh, recently in the last two years, I've actually been pursuing my MBA mm -hmm. and the, one of the very first classes we had was on effective decision-making. And I remember the first day of class, being like, why the hell do I need this class? I've been <laughs> for 20 years, I make decisions every day, right? You know, and, yeah, yeah. and it was interesting because by the end of that class, I had a true appreciation for mm. what you're talking about, about how to make sure for one, that we're answering even the right question, let alone, do we have all the information that we need? And so I, I can completely appreciate what you're saying. Um, now, I you, you write in your book that, the SWOT analysis, mm -hmm. which is where all, almost all of us go when we're having a problem in our business, you're saying that that creates a false comfort. Why do you say that? Yeah, Inc. Magazine recently had uh, an article, published an article by me about that topic. So this is often a problem for us as leaders. So I lead my own business of six people, disaster avoidance experts, the training, consulting and coaching company. So I'm a, I'm a small business owner and I know how tempting it is with SWOT analysis, which analyzes your strengths, weaknesses, opportunities and threats to feel comfortable when you do that. OK, I know my strengths, I know my weaknesses, I know my opportunities, I know my threats. I did the analysis. I can feel secure going forward. Unfortunately, that analysis provides false, a sense of false comfort because small business owners tend to be very optimistic. I'm a small business owner. I tend to be very optimistic. Mostly we start our businesses because we're optimists. We have good hopes for the future. That means, however, we tend to overestimate our strengths and opportunities and underestimate our weaknesses and the threats that, that are posed to us. So. Whenever I'm working with clients, I see all the time that this is exactly what they do. They have too many strengths, 
too many opportunities, too little weaknesses, too little threats. So you need to look much more at weaknesses and and threats than you tend to do in the SWOT analysis in order to actually get it right and not have this false sense of comfort and security, which leads you into disasters. Now, um, I only have time for two more questions, so I'm trying to figure out the best two. So you talk a lot about cognitive biases and how that is really the root of why going with our gut doesn't work because we, we, we go with things we know versus things that are hard, right? Because that's what, that's what humans do. So can you talk to us a little bit about how we can keep our, how we can really be aware of our cognitive mm. biases when we're trying to make important decisions? Yes. So... I'm an optimist, right? I said that earlier. Now, how did I learn that? I learned that by looking at what kind of errors I tend to make. Unfortunately, the large majority of small business owners don't look back at their decisions and why those decisions went wrong. They go like, well, that decision went wrong. Let me go to the next step, right? <laughs> and that is what the majority of, vast majority of people do. You want to look at your past decisions. What are your own personal patterns of making the wrong decisions? And to go out of that, seek your patterns of behavior, and how can you address that? If you tend to be too optimistic, that's one area. And maybe you're too overconfident. Do you make decisions too quickly? Very many people, this is a big, big tendency for us, don't generate enough options when they think about decisions. They just go for the first acceptable option. When if they took about 30 more minutes to look at more options, they would have made much more profit and avoided many more losses. So that's another area where small business owners need to look at. Are you too confident? Do you make decisions too quickly? Now, my book, Never Go With Your Gut, How Pioneering Leaders Make the Best Decisions and Avoid Business Disasters, has an assessment in the end. That's chapter seven. It goes through the 30 most dangerous cognitive biases for business owners, and it gives you the behaviors associated with each. So you can see how often they happen in your company you, how do you, much do your employers engage in it? How much do you engage in it? And how can you avoid these situations in the future? It gives you next steps for addressing these problems going forward. Well, Glip, you've given me so much to think about, and I hope he's given all of us stuff to think about because going over why something went wrong is really important. We call it an after action review, but it's something that is important. You do need to think about how did you make this mistake so that you don't repeat it, right? You know, because you can keep doing the, making the same mistake over, over and over and over again. Well, listen, don't go anywhere. Glee. I'm going to bring our other two guests back in right now, Miss Jane Atkinson and Kelvin Joseph, I'm going to bring them back in because now it is time for us to do what we call our hit it and quit it panel. So everybody come back in. Kelvin, Jane, Gleb, Gleb um, uh, Dr. T is, 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 he's now been called. I might even send, get you a t-shirt like that, mate. I'm, <laughs> I'm going to send it to you. Okay. So let's start with, um, Calvin's been quiet for a while, so let's get him to go first. And now here's how it works. I'm going to ask all you guys the exact same question. You're only going to get 30 seconds to answer, and you cannot repeat somebody else's answer. Got it? Got it. All right. So our first question is this. I'm going to go to Kevin, then Jane, then, then Dr. T. Excuse me. All right. Um, what is your favorite podcast? Calvin, go. Gary V. Gary V's podcast. You can take all that cursing. Okay, good for you. All right, <laughs> I can't. I can't listen to him. But anyway, all right, Jade. What is your favorite podcast? Well, I have been studying uh, Amy Porterfield's online marketing made easy podcast for several years now, leading up because I'm developing my own school and membership platform, and it has been so helpful. Really love her. I like Amy Porterfield's podcast as well. I just generally like her too. Um, awesome, awesome, awesome. All right. Dr. T, what is your favorite podcast? Well, besides your own, of course. <laughs> my favorite <laughs> my favorite podcast oh, is my favorite podcast besides that is You're Not So Smart by David McCraney. It's a great podcast, goes into the kind of decisions we make, the kind of errors we make. He's really good at actually pointing out the errors. My work focuses on how do you actually address them, how to solve the problems. But I think he's a genius at actually pointing out these issues that we suffer from. 
I really like him. And I heard him give an interview on NPR not too long mm. ago that I thought was just really brilliant, which brought him to my attention. All right. Um, next question, Jane, is coming to you first. What is your favorite business app? What is your favorite business app? Ooh, uh, probably Trip It Pro because when I travel, I have sent all of my travel plans over to this one email address. And then when somebody says, well, where are you going in the next year? I can just pull up my trip it and I'll be like there and there and there and there. And everything is in one place. And when your flight gets canceled, it gives you alternate flight options if you get the pro version. So. I like Trevor Pro too. I do too. All right. Uh, Gleb, what's your favorite? Um, excuse me, Dr. T. What is your favorite uh, business app? My favorite business app is Trello. It's a very good organization system. It's kind of a Kanban board, which means essentially an index card system where you can move index cards from column to column. I use it to organize my life. I have one for life stuff. I have one for business stuff. I use it to organize my personal productivity and I use it to organize my business. So my business is virtual. I have a lot of people. We don't have a central office. We have people working virtually. So it's a wonderful virtual collaboration system. Love it, love it. Calvin, what about you? My favorite business app is the Cash App. Send me my money. <laughs> <laughs> of course, of course you would say that. Of course you would say that. All right, all right. We're almost out of time. So here's I gotta go back to uh back to you, Jane. What is your favorite business book you've ever read? Favorite business book. Oh, well, I thought you were going to ask me what was my most current one. And I'm actually really, because, you know, my memory is not very good, but um, I would have to say that um, I, I wish I would have read it sooner. It's uh, Traction by, and I didn't know he was Floyd Wickman's son, but Gino Wickman is Floyd Wickman's son. And um, he was a big nsa -er. Anyway, Traction really lays out. I knew for a long time how to run a speaking business, but now I know how to run a business business, any business. Love it, love, yeah. it, love it. I actually love that book too. All right, Calvin, what's your favorite business book? My, my favorite that got me started is um, Rich Dad, Poor Dad and Robert Kiyosaki and just gets you with that entrepreneurial mindset, that real hustle. But I, I also love... Um, getting to yes uh, on negotiation. A lot of business people split the difference and, and leave a lot of money on the table. I never split the dis difference. I win, <laughs> I win most of, of the time. Course, of course you don't. Of course you don't. Right. All right. Dr. T, what's your favorite business book? I think my favorite business book, one that was most helpful, is the Emith series of books. And that was really good partially because it's about creating systems and processes. Systems and processes are incredibly underappreciated by small business owners. They just go through the, the process, they handle everything by themselves. Whereas if you create a system and a process, it just makes things so much easier. So that was incredibly right, helpful. So you, so you took oh, my, there you go. You took my damn book, but that's okay. Um, my favorite book is The E-Myth Revisited by Michael oh, there you go. But I'm going to give you my backup book. <laughs> It was written by my college classmate, Mike McCallowitz. Um, Profit First is, is one of my, my, my second favorite uh, business books I've read. So I'll give my hokey brother a shout out. Anyway, listen, thank you all three of you so much for being on Small Biz Chat Live tonight. You guys have been a blast. Uh, thank you so much, Kelvin Joseph, Jane Atkinson, Dr. T, Gleb Tispersky. Thank you all for joining me. And please head over to uh, my blog, SucceedIsYourOwnBoss.com. You can get more information on tonight's guest tomorrow. And thank you all for watching Small Biz Chat Live. It is my honor and privilege to be your small biz lady. And the goal of Small Biz Chat is to end small business failure. And I will leave you with this. You never lose in business. Either you win or you learn. Good night, everybody. See you next time.